I thought that I would get a fair trial. And that's why I went as long as I did without taking a plea, because I really believed that once I got in front of a jury, they were going to see how ridiculous this was and I was going to be acquitted. But what ended up happening, and forgive me if I've uh, told these stories before, but I think they're important. Uh, what the government did with me and what they will almost certainly do with Julian is to invoke something called SIPA, the Classified Information Protection Act. That changes everything related to this trial. So what happens is that all of the attorneys on both sides will have to be granted temporary security clearances and literally everything, every scrap of information that comes up in the case is considered to be classified, a classified document. Uh, Julian would not even be allowed to meet with his attorneys in their offices. All meetings would have to be either in the Justice Department's secure conference room, which is where I had to meet my attorneys every time, or uh, they would build a temporary secure area called a skiff inside the courthouse, and they would bring Julian out of the holding cell, provided that he's not granted bail, and he would meet his attorneys in the courthouse. It's very, very difficult, and it's especially difficult because you're not allowed to take notes on any of these documents. They're classified. And so you can't, you can't jot something down. Your lawyers can't jot something down to jog their memories, nothing. You walk in, they check you. You don't have anything that you're carrying in with you. And then when you come out, they check you again and make sure you don't have anything you're coming out with. That was one problem. Another problem is that there's something called a section six conversation. I had never heard of this ever in my life until it was invoked in my case. I had asked for 70 documents to be declassified so that I could defend myself. And that's what I needed. I needed 70 documents. With these 70 documents, I was confident that I would be acquitted. And so we made 70 separate motions for Judge Brinkema to uh, review each one and we would hope declassify them. So we blocked off two days for these hearings and we went into the courtroom and the judge said, um, I'm going to make this easy for everybody. And I'm going to deny all 70 of these motions. And my lawyers jumped up objection, your honor. He said, my lead attorney said, it'll be impossible for us to defend him if we don't have access to any of these documents, these documents prove that this was a vindictive and selective prosecution, which was one of our contentions. The prosecutor jumped up and said, your honor, section six conversation. I had never heard of that. As soon as those words came out of his mouth, my lawyers objected again and their objection was overruled. And I said to one of the lawyers, what's happening? He said, just a minute, this is really important. And then he said, Your Honor, at least let counsel into the chambers. You can leave the defendant out. Let us come into chambers. And she said, Motion denied. So what it meant was that the prosecutors, all six of them, got to go into the judge's chambers. God knows what they told her in there, because my lawyers weren't allowed in. And then they came out and she said, I am denying all 70 of these motions. And then that was it. She hit her gavel and it was the end of it. We start walking out of the courtroom and I said to my lead attorney, what just happened in there? And he said, uh, we just lost the case. That's what happened. I said, so now what do we do? He said, now we talk about a plea. I told him, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not taking a plea. And he turned and he said, you know what your problem is? You think this is about justice and it's not about justice. It's about mitigating damage. And I took a plea a week later. That's what I fear is going to happen to Julian. It's not about justice. It's about mitigating damage because once they decide they're going to get you, they're going to get you unless you're fortunate enough to be holed up in an embassy someplace. You know, as bad as things are in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, they're not as bad as they are in ADX Marion or ADX Florence. You know, so I, I fear oh. 
not that Julian is going to be found guilty. I think in a fair trial, he would clearly be found not guilty. He's a journalist. But it won't be a fair trial. The fix is in, especially in this district, the Eastern District of Virginia. I'll add one more thing. I hired O.J. Simpson's jury consultant. He happened to be the uncle of my best friend's wife. And so he did it pro bono. He flew up to Washington from Dallas. We got him a security clearance and he went through thousands and thousands of pages of classified documents. Finally, when he finished, we met all the attorneys. I had 11 attorneys plus this guy. We met to discuss strategy. And he said, listen, take the deal. If we were in any other district in America, I would tell you, let's go for it. We're going to win this thing. But the Eastern District of Virginia, you don't have a prayer. Your jury is going to be made up of people who are from or who have relatives with the CIA, the FBI, the Defense Department, Homeland Security, or intelligence community contractors. You don't stand a chance. And so that's finally what made me take the deal. Again, that's exactly what I fear is going to happen with Julian. You didn't, you didn't stand a chance also because they wouldn't let your lawyers into the court, into the judge's chambers to look no, at and, evidence. No, and they, they could have told her anything uh, in, in that meeting. They could have said that, yeah. that I had, you know, child pornography on my computer, or I beat my wife, or I... I have a Russian passport and I'm going to flee the country. God knows what they said to her back there. But she came out and she said, nothing doing. No defense. I, I want to ask you about bring but before that, I just want to tell our audience that when you talked about mitigating damage in your case was the revelation of the truth that the United States was participating, the CIA in, in particular, in torture. Correct. So that got out and they want to mitigate that damage. In Julian's case, They'd want to somehow mitigate the damage that they suffered from their own actions that were revealed in uh, absolutely vetted and correct and true documents that were leaked to WikiLeaks and then published. These are their crimes that Julian exposed. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And they're going to flip it around like they did with you. It was their crime of torture, which is against U.S. and international law that you exposed. And then rather than the country rallying around to prosecute the officials in favor of that. We've got one of them I'm responsible for it. We've got one of them running the CIA right now, Gina Hospital, and you were prosecuted, just like yes. Chelsea Manning, who revealed video evidence of war crimes, prima facie evidence of a war crime. He's the one who went to jail and was in solitary and pretty much suffered torture himself. I wanted to ask you about, before Brinkham, one, one question about uh, the skiff that you uh, yeah. I was talking to Tom Drake. He told me that they built, indeed, built one of those skiffs at the Baltimore courtroom, federal courthouse in Baltimore, where he was tried or was about to be tried. Is your feeling if it was inside the courtroom or the Justice Department, and you probably have no proof of this, that your attorney client privilege would be violated, that they'd somehow be listening in? Oh, absolutely. Or absolutely. I, I assumed from the very first day that uh, that they were tracking everything we were we were discussing they were looking at exactly what cables we were we were uh, reading or what we were printing uh, or or even that they were going through our files when uh, when we finally left for the day I just assumed that they had access to everything another not very discouraging fact now Brinkema would most likely in your opinion be the judge if there were a trial of Julian Assange correct yes. It would be Brinkema. Over the course of many years, she has reserved all national security cases for herself. One thing about Brinkema, Courtroom too, 700. Brinkema really, really loves to see her name in print. It's not just national security cases. See, in, in most federal district courts, uh, you're assigned a case just based on whoever's uh, uh, turn it is, right? They're just assigned one after the other after the other. In the Eastern District of Virginia, the judges pick and choose what cases they want to hear. And then the cases that really nobody wants, and they're usually minor cases, are generally given to the, um, the more junior federal judges. I forget the name. Uh, but Brinkema takes all the, all the national security cases. She had mine. She had Jeffrey Sterling's. She had Zacharias Musawi. She has Ed Snowden. And now we know, thanks to this mistake that the Justice Department made, that they have that she has Julian as well. 
Well, she also has another high profile case or had one that was high profile until very recently. A woman bought up a, a painting at a yard sale for $5 and it looked very much like a Monet, like an original Monet. And as it turned out, it was an original Monet and it had been stolen from the, the Walker Art Museum in Baltimore in the 1950s. And it was in somebody's house for a half a century, they died and uh, it ended up in this yard sale and it sold for five bucks. Well, the museum wanted their painting <laughs> back. And this woman said, no, I bought this painting for five bucks and it's going in my living room. And the museum sued her. Judge Brinkema assigned the case to herself because there was so much media interest in this long lost masterpiece from Monet that she knew she'd be in the post every day. And she was, she was in the post every day that this trial went on. And then the museum got their painting back, but that's what she does. You know, she, she very discreetly makes sure that she stays in the news. And what better case to keep her in the news every single day than Julian Assange? Yeah, I want to add one more thing about Brinkema. Uh, she has sure. this. She has this kind of uh, kind of a tick. Uh, it's something that she repeats over and over and over again with every defendant. Uh, when she hands down sentence, and it doesn't matter if it's a day or if it's a hundred years, she says that it's fair and appropriate. And if you sit in her courtroom, you'll hear her repeat it in every single case, fair and appropriate. Well, on the day of my sentencing, I was the last person to be sentenced. So I sat there for hours waiting to be sentenced. Everybody in front of me had a federal drug case. Uh, one of them was this major trafficker from Thailand. Most of them were just guys who were smoking weed at the Iwo Jima or whatever. Um, and then there were a couple who were undocumented. Now, if you got caught smoking weed at the Iwo Jima, she gave you a year and a day. If you were an undocumented immigrant, you were going to get three to five years followed by deportation. Well, she would hand out these, what I consider to be draconian drug sentences, and children are crying and clinging at their fathers and the wives are crying and she's splitting up these families right there in front of you. And as they're wailing in court, she just leans forward and she says, that sentence is fair and appropriate. Well, there's, there's nothing fair or appropriate about destroying families, deliberately destroying families uh, because a guy was smoking a joint. You're going you're gonna to make it so he doesn't see his children for the next 20 years. You're going to deport him to a country that he doesn't even know anymore. But that's what Brinkema does. She's uh, she's a hanging judge. What was her fair and appropriate sentence to New York, John? Well, that's a good question. Uh, in, in my case, she deemed 10 years to be fair and appropriate. But my attorneys had negotiated something called an 11C1C plea which meant that it was written in stone and it had been agreed to with the prosecutors. And that was for, for two and a half years, 30 months. So in the sentence or in the sentencing phase in the hearing, she said that she had been a judge since 1986. She had been a prosecutor before that. And she had never had an 11 C one C plea. And she looked at me and she said into the microphone, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. And if I could, I would sentence you to 10 years in prison. But she couldn't. So she accepted the two and a half and I counted my blessings. Did you serve the entire two and a half? Yeah, I, I, got, I got no halfway house time off at all. Not one hour of halfway house time. I did the whole stretch. And it was because I, um, I wrote a blog from prison called Letters from Loretto. It became my second book. And uh, I continued to expose waste, fraud, and abuse at the prison and in the Bureau of Prisons. It enraged them. They tried repeatedly to throw me into solitary. I told them, go ahead. I said, I've been nose to nose with Al Qaeda, with Hezbollah, with the Iranians, and I'm supposed to be afraid of your solitary in Loretto, Pennsylvania? Please. I said, give me a little bit of credit. And they would back off. They always backed off. And then one time, um, one of the guards mentioned to a friend of mine 
that the reason that they kept threatening me and then not doing anything was that I had access to the media and they were afraid that if they sent me to solitary, that CNN would be waiting for them in the parking lot and they just wouldn't be able to answer. So it saved. That's me. interesting. That leads you to that leads you to the next question I want to ask you. How did uh, your revelation of torture? When the trial went on, obviously that had to be front and center. So uh, whether you were convicted or not, the public got to hear. I would think if the press covered the trial fairly, that America was torturing. Now, uh, since you serve time, we don't hear about that. That's yeah. not in the public conscious. That just fa fades in to the normal lives that we live, just the way surveillance and all of Snowden's revelations were maybe a shock when they came out for a while. But now it's just part of the fabric of our lives in the U.S. that we're being surveilled uh, illegally. Uh, so what lasting effect, uh, 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 if any, did your revelation of America torturing have? And how much do you blame the media if there hasn't been any? Oh, I, I do blame the media, the mainstream media anyway. Uh, you know, my revelations led, and, and these are not my words, these are John McCain's words. My revelations led to the McCain-Feinstein Amendment, uh, which says that it bans torture. It doesn't actually ban torture. What it does is it, it makes, um, it makes all national uh, security interrogations uh, fall under the uh, Army Field Manual. Okay, and the Army Field Manual is very clear about what you're allowed to do in an interrogation and what you're not allowed to do. But that's an executive document. And so if you want to bring back a torture program and do it legally, all you have to do is change the Army Field Manual. And any president can do that with a stroke of a pen. You don't need any congressional action. So I like to think oh, that my... Don't say that, John. Trump may be listening. Yeah, yeah. I, I he, may, he may not know he could do that. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, at least we, we haven't had a torture program since I went public. That, that made it worthwhile. But you're right, Joe, the, the public doesn't really care. When Gina Haspel was named CIA director, uh, the Washington Post called me and they asked me if I would write an op-ed uh, in opposition to the nomination. I did it gladly. And they gave me 1,200 words on the front page of the Sunday opinion section, major soapbox. Uh, it led to a half a dozen death threats. Uh, it was a big mess, but I got my side of the story out. And then even Rand Paul called me and asked me to go up to his office the next day, which I did to strategize on how to defeat this nomination. Uh, the Democrats went soft at the end, the likes of, of Mark Warner and Joe Manchin. They went soft and Gina Haspel became CIA director. Uh, but the story just went away. It just went away quietly. And now what pains me the most is if you look at public opinion polls, a clear majority of Americans uh, support a torture program. After all these years, after all these revelations, after exposure of of these monstrous things that were being done to human beings, a majority of Americans supports a torture program. That's the most disappointing thing to me. And I, and I do blame the mainstream media for that because they could have jumped on this issue and they did not. Lisa, uh, one thing you said was that this uh, law that came out of your case banned again torture. It was already banned. Yeah. By the Convention yeah. Against Torture. That's right. Oh, you and, and, and not just the national treaty signed by Senate, uh, ratified by the Senate, which automatically yeah. becomes U.S. law. So, what did they ban? They banned something. They, it's like banning murder again. I don't get yes. it. Yes. Again, forgive me if I sound like a broken record, but uh, not only are we signatories to the to the United Nations Convention Against Torture, we were actually the the drafters, the authors of that convention. Besides that. We have a federal law in this country called the Federal Anti-Torture Act of 1946. And it specifically banned those things that we were doing to prisoners at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. In 1946, we executed Japanese soldiers who had waterboarded American POWs. We, that was a death penalty charge to waterboard somebody. In January, 1968, the Washington Post ran a front page photograph of an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. The day that that picture ran, 
Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense at the time, ordered an investigation. That soldier was arrested. He was charged with torture, convicted, and sentenced to 20 years at Leavenworth. Well, the law never changed over all those years. Never. So I always contended that it made no sense for something to be a crime in 1946 and a crime in 1968 and then perfectly legal in 2002. It made no sense. It was it was a bastardization of the law. Without any changes, any re- legislation overturning it, of course. Correct. You said there's, n- there's no torture program now. Well, do you need a program to torture people? No, Can't you certainly do- not. Isn't there freelance torturing? Freelance there's, torturing going on? Yeah, there's a lot of freelance torturing. I mean, we, we have no idea really what our soldiers are doing on any given day in Afghanistan or in Syria or in Yemen or Somalia or any of the other hundred plus countries where they happen to be. We have no idea. You know, we, we get information out in drips and drabs, like this uh, soldier in Afghanistan who was questioning an Al-Qaeda suspect or Taliban suspect really is what he was. And then as he was taking him back out of the base to take him back to his village, saw a, a, one of the sources who was from the same village. And rather than expose the source, our soldier took his guy out and shot him in the head and buried him in a shallow grave. And is shocked. He's shocked. He's been charged with murder. Well, that kind of thing happens all the time. We just never hear about it. So I, I would call that in part a torture program. John, what do you think is worse for, from the government's point of view, U.S. government's point of view? Your revelation of torture or the revelations of WikiLeaks? And how would uh, Assange be treated by that judge, and depending on your answer? I, I don't think that either one of them were bad. I, I think Julian's revelations were more embarrassing. And that's really the question here. We know now with, with hindsight that literally nothing that Julian revealed led to any kind of a long-term problem for the United States. It didn't expose sources and methods. It didn't expose, excuse me, it didn't expose uh, the names of confidential uh, informants. It it didn't jeopardize relationships. It exposed crimes. Uh, And there's actually a law in this country saying that it's illegal to classify a program that is a crime. You can't legally classify something just to keep yourself from being embarrassed by it. And Julian embarrassed them. So I think that his case is more important for the government than mine was. I would also say that I agree with uh, Garland in that they don't want Julian to mount a defense. They're going to want him to, uh, to take a plea and to keep his mouth shut because God knows the damage that Julian could cause them in court. You know, my, my attorneys early on in my case raised uh, something called the issue of gray mail, not blackmail, but it's kind of gray. And what that meant is, or was in my case, look, I was at the CIA for 15 years. Half of that was in counterterrorism operations, which is the ugliest, bloodiest part of CIA operations. Horrible things happen in counterterrorism. You see horrible things, war crimes, crimes against humanity, human rights violations, and you keep your mouth shut because it's wartime, things like that happen. You convince yourself to keep your mouth shut. Well, it's the same thing with Julian. God knows what Julian knows from all the different documents that he's seen. The the government can't be confident that WikiLeaks has released literally everything, and they're going to be afraid that Julian's going to get up on the stand to defend himself, and he's going to reveal more classified information. Now, that's going to force the government to the negotiating table because the last thing they want is Julian on the stand testifying on his own behalf. Probably won't happen. You said that after uh, there's no official torture program in part because of your revelations. Mm-hmm. But so in other words, there are no black sites, perhaps, although it could still be going on. Yeah. What, oh, um, yeah. Right. I think that's you had the- some impact. Yes. You had some impact, though. In the end, you served two and a half years in prison un- unjustly, but you did, in the end, do something that may have been worth it for you uh, because there's at least been uh, 
an ending yeah. of official torture. Go on. No, John please. McCain told the New York Times in um, 2015 that it was only because of my revelations that that the McCain-Feinstein Amendment uh, passed. And indeed, it took eight years after my revelations for McCain-Feinstein to pass. But he said that that had I not said anything, um, the American people would not have known that we were torturing prisoners. So that, that made it all worthwhile. You know, John McCain was wrong on 99% of his policies, but on torture, he was he was completely right. Well, for obvious reasons, because he if he hadn't experienced it himself, maybe he wouldn't have been. That's right. Now, uh, Trump on the campaign trail and in debates, in the primaries anyway, said that he wanted to bring back Worse than water torture. Yeah, he said waterboarding is a hell of a lot worse. Hell of a lot worse. <laughs> now, the guy's a big BS artist. We know that. He's always exaggerating everything. Everything's great. Everything's bigger. Everything's going to be worse. Uh, but still, you say that he has not brought back an official torture program, even with Ms. Haspel at the helm in Langley. This yeah. is quite extraordinary. But we is- don't really know, do we? We don't know. Um, She was questioned at length on this issue in her nomination hearing, her confirmation hearing before the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee uh, publicly and I I would assume privately as well. And um, she actually made a reference to my revelations saying that in the end, she realized and the organization realized that the program was probably not legal. Now that's as that's as good of an admission as we're going to get from Bloody Gina Haspel. But um, um, yeah, but, but she she told lawmakers, uh, in, including Republicans, that there would be no torture program on her watch. That that was a a dark day for the agency. That the program was conceived and implemented in the in the ugly days post nine eleven, and that it wasn't coming back. Now. We're going to have to take her word for it, I suppose, and rely on the media to uh, to make sure that she is telling the truth and continues to tell the truth. But officially, as it stands now, there are no black sites uh, anywhere. But you know what, Joe? That's not to say you don't really need a black site in order to torture somebody. What you do is a, an extraordinary rendition. Now, a rendition is if I if I'm in Pakistan and you're an Egyptian and I catch you in Pakistan, I send you back to Egypt because you're Egyptian. That's, that's an extraordinary rendition. I mean, that's a rendition. An extraordinary rendition is if I'm in Pakistan, you're an Egyptian, I catch you and I send you to Israel for interrogation or Syria or Libya. And I say to those intelligence guys, now don't torture him, right? And you wink, don't torture him. But uh, whatever he says, uh, send us a memo and let us know. Give us the transcript. That's an extraordinary rendition. Those are illegal. But the CIA has never come out to say, we don't do extraordinary renditions. They've never said that they don't do them. Uh, while your revelations had, had some effect positive, as McCain has said and others, as you've laid out here, what about the revelations of Julian Assange? The, of the week of WikiLeaks of the war crimes committed, has that had would that have had any impact on the U.S. no longer committing war crimes? I don't see it myself. No. What do you think? No, I don't think so either. I as terrible as that sounds. I mean, what Julian exposed being a being a video, in my opinion, was so much more impactful than what I exposed. Uh, because you could see it and then you could keep going back to it on, on YouTube that you're watching a war crime unfold before your eyes. That should have led to statutory changes. It should have led to, to uh, military officers going to prison. It should have led to people being reduced in rank. It should have led to policy changes. And none of those things happened. None of them. The government through the media, was able to turn the debate to make the debate about WikiLeaks and not about the war crimes that WikiLeaks uh, uh, exposed. And one could argue that war crimes are worse than torture, even. (laughs) Of a higher order. Mm -hmm. And it's had no impact 
And another thing that we should have seen was editorials in the New York Times and the Washington Post insisting that those people responsible, the pilots, their superiors, whoever was responsible, be prosecuted and charged, that the U.S. never do this again. And instead, they've turned around and also made it about now Assange personally to smear him when they once profited from his work, including in those days, because they made the Bush administration look bad. This is my view. Uh, <clears throat> now that he's made the Democrats, Hillary in particular, <clears throat> look bad, he's he's got to be attacked and smeared and oh, lost yeah. in all this or the war crimes that were revealed. It is just it's accepted now. There's been no change or any impact. At least in your case, there's been at least a, an official disbanding of an official program of torture, whether it carries on or not. We're in, in, uh, in the revelations of WikiLeaks, and there were so many films and documents, but the premier one is this video you're talking about, I would think you'd have to say, that shows in action a prima facie evidence of war crime. There's been no impact at all, and the media has turned against this guy, Yes, uh, which is just unbelievable to me. Shocking. Shocking and disappointing. I agree. I have a question on that for for John, and that, and that is, um, what do you you were mentioning the the way in which you know torture and and that was exposed in previous decades was prosecuted. What do you think has has changed the culture around that to the point where now there is no prosecution about it, and, and in fact you you were the one that was prosecuted for revealing it. Is there any specific reason that you can think of, or multiple? Yeah, oh, yeah it was it was nine eleven. Nine eleven was so traumatic inside the CIA. It was such a colossal intelligence failure. Every CIA officer in that building felt at the time that he had the blood of 2,000 Americans on his hands. Um, you know, you're paid to do one thing and that's protect the country and you fail utterly and completely. And then at the same time, just after 9-11, Osama bin Laden released a statement saying that that Al Qaeda was planning a, an attack that would dwarf 9/11, and I, we had to believe him. So, um, so people went completely overboard in just ignoring the law, the rule of law, human rights, civil liberties. They just did away with them. I naively believed at the time that it was a pendulum, and the pendulum would swing back in the proper direction, back toward a respect for human rights and civil liberties. And that just never happened. What happened instead was organiza organizations like the CIA, the NSA, the FBI at all, um, saw this newfound authority and said, oh, this is better than we've ever had it. We're never giving this up. And so they began doing, or CIA and NSA began doing what J. Edgar Hoover had perfected in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and that is going to Congress every year and scaring the shit out of members of Congress about threats against the country and then demanding ridiculous increases in budgets and then getting it. I remember going up to Kofor Black one day. Kofor became ambassador Kofor Black, but he was the director of the CIA's counterterrorism center. And this was about uh, three, four months after 9-11. And I, I caught him in the hall and I said, Kofor, I just need one minute. I have an idea for an operation that I want to do. And he put up his hands and he said, whatever it is, just do it. I have so much money, I can't possibly spend it all. And so I did it. There was no oversight. There was no board that I had to argue before. There was no chain of command that I needed to get permissions from. I just did it. I booked myself a business class ticket and I went and did it just like that. And the CIA likes it when nobody's looking over their shoulders. That's incredible. He didn't want to know what it was. Huh? He did not want to know what it was. Oh, no, you he, told him what it was you were going to do. No, no, no. Yeah. He, he didn't even know it. He didn't care what it was. You know, was it to capture Arabs? Go. Go do it. Another thing, too. Uh, do you remember the movie The Kingdom with Jamie Foxx and a couple of other big stars? Well, there's a scene. There are two scenes in that movie. One is where an FBI agent is going to go to Saudi Arabia to investigate a terrorist attack that killed his best friend. And as he's leaving, um, the best friend's widow whispers into his ear, kill them all. And at the end of the film, where he's found the mastermind of the attack, 
he shoots this guy and the guy's granddaughter kneels down and she's crying, oh, Abba, you're shot, you're dying. And he tells her, my daughter, grow up and kill them all. And when I was leaving for Pakistan to head counterterrorism uh, operations there, as I was leaving, the guys in my branch were shaking my hand, you know, Godspeed, good luck, be careful. And my boss leaned forward and he said, kill them all. And I remember thinking, my God, is this what we've come to? And it, it, it was, that's what we had come to. Wow. That's uh, quite interesting. I hope that isn't classified stuff you're telling us here, John. No. Nope. nope. Wanna... It's all in book number one. It's not classified. If they told you to. Did they told you to kill them all? Is not a classified uh, order. Nope. <laughs> you you're allowed to go and do whatever you want. Uh, Tom yeah. Drake uh, told me a story. You reminded me of Tom Drake, of course, being the whistleblower from the NSA, who first revealed the wireless wiretapping in the Baltimore Sun. They almost put him in jail, but he stuck to his guns and the government knew they didn't have a case and they dropped it in the end. He told me that right after a couple of days after 9-11, that his superior that he was working with, she was number three in the agency, in the, agency in the NSA, went around, talked to the troops, you know, the lower level grunts working the surveillance and to try to keep the spirits up after 9-11. And uh, they were quite upset as Drake was that they'd failed the country. They took their job seriously about providing security, national security for the American people. And they were upset that they'd failed, that they had not discovered this 9-11 plot before it happened. And she apparently said, uh, according to Tom, uh, would you, this was the best thing that ever, ever could happen to the agency. You know how much money we're going to get? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they, and they were shocked. Absolutely. That story tells you a little bit about uh, in these agencies, FBI, NSA, probably it's CIA. There are lower level people who, who actually believe what they're supposed to be doing and want to do the job to protect the U.S. And inevitably, a lot higher level folks don't see it that way and have been known to quash investigations if they're getting too close to powerful interests or whatever. And just like Sabelle Edmonds' story, if you know, is that she her investigation that she had started uh, was stopped by the FBI. And I talked to, I worked on that, talked to an FBI agent at his home outside Denver, and he more or less confirmed that that was true, that they were shocked that they were told to stand out. So was that the same with the CIA as well? Were they idealistic agents, or is it more corrupt than the FBI, than the NSA? I found the corruption, like Tom, like Tom Drake did, I found the corruption to come from the, the management levels at the CIA and not, not the lower management. I mean, I was, I was a branch chief, uh, what, three times. It, it wasn't at my level, but it was above that at the, um, at the level of division chief or office director or the deputy directors uh, of the CIA. It was all politics for them. They weighed everything with, uh, against how it would play at the White House and how would it play on Capitol Hill. And then at the deputy director level up at the top, they kind of sort of worried about whether or not it was legal or if we could argue successfully that it was legal, even if it was clearly illegal. You know, there are so many ways to twist words and phrases and, and say that up is down and night is day. And if they think that they can pull that off, they go for it. But yeah, I, 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 my experience at the agency was very, very similar to Tom's experience at, at NSA. Yeah, well, that's what I expected. So to sum up what we were saying, uh, while your whistleblowing did lead to some concrete um, changes, uh, you don't think that WikiLeaks, or do you think WikiLeaks revelations of war crimes and other um, malfeasance by the U.S. government will lead to any kind of changes? It will just be accepted and continue as normal. Yeah, I think that's the unfortunate case. And I think it's because Julian has been portrayed in the mainstream media, even by the recipients of his revelations um, as, as a criminal. It's crazy the way it happened. It's crazy. He's a Russian mole. He was a, a, a Republican um, asset that 
was used to uh, deny Hillary Clinton the presidency. You hear all kinds of stupid, crazy scenarios. But uh, yeah, the mainstream media, I think, has forsaken him. And because of that, we won't see uh, substantive changes. No. And, and they want to make sure that nobody else ever tries that again. And they're also, as Elizabeth has been saying, they've been using him to promote and further this Russiagate story. Absolutely. Uh, <coughs> yeah. And I think that it's interesting. It's not just the media. It's also entities that um, describe themselves as uh, media, like unbiased arbiters of, of bias, like Media Bias Fact Check. These organizations will label WikiLeaks as known associates of, of the Kremlin and Putin. They'll label them as providing inaccurate or mixed accuracy in their information. But then they'll, at the same time, label the Atlantic Council totally unbiased and totally reliable. So I think that there is definitely a, an effort to smear Julian Assange, not just in the media, but in across all sorts of different organizations so that the public doesn't trust what WikiLeaks published, for sure. Well, that's the essence of it then, right? Ooh. To question the validity of, the, of any new revelations that come out. Definitely. And that's, uh, that's uh, disturbing. That executive order, by the way, that John referred to is 13526. And it was signed by Barack Obama, which says that the government, no, nobody in government can classify a document if it covers up a crime that's being committed or even embarrassment. So based on that order, Julian Assange should be able to walk out of the embassy tomorrow because all he's done is reveal crimes and embarrassment. And um, that's not a crime then under Obama's executive order because uh, it wasn't, shouldn't have been classified to begin with. So if it wasn't classified, uh, he's not revealed classified information.